Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would like to say Jazakallah khairan to my brother IHB for sponsoring my channel. May Allah reward him for his work to spread Islam. Hinduism is a religion that developed in India through what is now known as the Vedic period between 1750 and 500 BCE. The belief system contains an array of different scriptures that are considered holy chief of which are the Vedas, which are claimed to be divinely inspired. There are four Vedas, which were revealed over a period of 600 years. Like the Buddhist texts, Hindu scholars posit that the Vedas were solely orally transmitted for centuries. According to scholar Burjur Avari and Michael Witzel, the Vedas were only written down in 500 BCE, an entire millennia after their revelation. However, the oldest manuscripts of the text actually accessible to us today are from the 11th century in Nepal, which makes the total period of only oral transmission 2,000 years, according to Witzel. To make matters worse, most of the Vedic authorship is unknown, and there are no chains of transmission. Nearly the entire process of preservation is anonymous. In comparison to the rigorous work Muslim scholars put into ensuring every narrator and author of a saying of the Prophet is recorded, Hinduism seems to totally lack such a system. Another important thing to note is that the concept of Hinduism as a single religion is a very modern idea. Scholar Richard King states in his book, Orientalism and the Modern Myth of Hinduism. Western Orientalists searched for the essence of the Hindu religions discerning this in the Vedas, and meanwhile creating the notion of Hinduism as a unified body of religious praxis and the popular picture of mystical India. This idea of a Vedic essence was taken over by Hindu reform movements, such as the Brahmo Samaj, which was supported for a while by the Unitarian Church, together with the ideas of universalism and perennialism, the idea that all religions share a common mystic ground. This is extremely crucial to know because of the implications it has on the idea of Hinduism as a religion. Formerly, the people of India had a plethora of different beliefs, mostly surrounding the local deities of their village or town. With the arrival of the British, the concept of the Vedas as the central scripture and the idea that all religions lead to the same path took over the subcontinent. While it is true that these ideas existed at least partially beforehand, they were never represented much in the minds of the masses. It can therefore be said that over the millennia of Islamic dominance in India, the subcontinent was divided between the largely unified monotheistic followers of Islam and the thousands of different mostly polytheistic worldviews and religions scattered across the territory of India. The narrative of a historically unified force against Islam found in Hindu nationalist beliefs today is ironically totally absent. In fact, this is not something controversial. I urge any Hindus watching this video to refer to the statement by India's Supreme Court regarding this issue. Unlike other religions in the world, the Hindu religion does not claim any one prophet. It does not worship any one god. It does not believe in any one philosophical concept. It does not follow any one act of religious rites or performances. In fact, it does not satisfy the traditional features of a religion or creed. Whilst to some this approach of pluralism may seem favorable, it really begs the multiple questions. For example, what distinguishes all worldviews from being Hinduism then? Is it because these particular positions are held by people who historically inhabited the Indian subcontinent? If so, why is Islam not also considered part of Hinduism to Hindus, as Muslims have dwelt in India for almost a thousand years? The concept of Hinduism demonstrates its arbitrariness with these problems. The generally accepted concepts of Hinduism include karma, theophany, reincarnation, and panentheism. The most important of these views for our purposes are theophany, meaning God entering creation in some tangible form, and panentheism, meaning that God exists in all things. Both of these views are demonstrably illogical. The Hindu scripture seems to refute itself on this issue. Bhavat Gita 724 states, the ignorant believe that unmanifest one God incarnates or takes manifestations because they do not completely understand my highest immutable, incomparable, and transcendental existence. Meanwhile, Bhavad Gita 631 states, One who perceives me as dwelling in all things in whatever condition, 
such a believer dwells in me. Ironically, Hindus believe that God does in fact incarnate and manifest into creation as detailed throughout the Hindu texts and religions. Ganesh, Rama, Krishna, and loads of other persons who indeed are believed to have been physically existent humans. Many Indian philosophers and saints throughout history have also been listed as manifestations of God. The Gita calls people who believe in such things as ignorant, yet other verses and texts present such beliefs. This is a clear example of yet another contradiction. Gita 7.14 states, My divine energy Maya, consisting of three modes of nature, is very difficult to overcome. Maya is God's essence, according to Hindus. The three modes of nature are understood by Hindu scholars as the consciousness of living things. On this view, souls of living things are considered as God's energy or part of him. If it is accepted that a soul, a human, is both soul and body combined, with the soul controlling the body, to say that our souls are God is to say that every human is a deity. And this is absurd because every human soul clearly has a distinction from one another. In other words, every person is fully different from another person in both body and mind. Yet Hindus say that every person is the same as another person in mind because they are all one essence or one deity. Panentheism is the view that God exists transcendentally or above everything, yet abides within all his creation, or they are a part of him. It sounds contradictory from the get-go, and if we delve a bit further into it, we can confirm that it is. God in Hinduism is considered to be immaterial, all-powerful, all-knowing, and the creator of all things. Meanwhile, his creation is material, weak, limited in knowledge, and dependent on him for existence. To say that God is his creation is absurd because their characteristics are at odds. In plain terms, to say God is present in everything at once, yet also above everything, is illogical. If God is in everything, he's not above it, and if he's above everything, he's not in it. Sikhism is a religion which emerged in 15th century North India, at the time ruled by Muslim kings with large Hindu populations. It emerged initially as a movement started by a man named Guru Nanak, who was born into a Hindu family. Gurus in, Hind in Sikhism can be seen as prophetic figures who reveal information to humanity. And in fact, Guru literally means teacher or master. In total, there were 10 Gurus of Sikhism, the last of which was Guru Gobind Singh, who died in 1708. This means that the religion has a revelation period of around 200 years. From the fifth guru onwards, the position became based on lineage rather than merit, so only a guru's children could succeed him in the position. The main scripture of Sikhism was initially known as Adi Granth, compiled by the fifth guru, Arjan. Six scholars claim that the Sikh scripture was orally transmitted since the days of Guru Nanak in the form of musical hymns. It was not until Guru Arjun's older brother, namely Prithi Chand, started spreading an older version, an apparently incorrect version of the Sikh texts on palm leaves, that Arjun decided to compile the Adi Granth. From this point onwards, new parts were added to the scripture, and eventually it was renamed to Guru Granth Sahib. According to Oxford Handbook of Sikh Studies, in the 19th and 20th century, several manuscripts versions of Adi Granth and Guru Granth Sahib hymns were discovered. This triggered contesting theories about authenticity and how canonical the texts of Sikhism evolved over time. An interesting thing to note is that it was not necessarily Orientalist or foreign scholars who questioned the uniformity of Sikh texts, but Sikh scholars themselves. For example, scholar P.R. Singh believes these versions developed because of the forgetfulness or creativity of the local Sikh leaders, errors made by scribes, attempts to adopt popular hymns or bhagats or adapt the hymns to local regional languages where Gurmukhi, the language of the scripture, was not understood. It is these manuscripts that Guru Arjan collected and considered, then edited to produce an approved version of the Adi Granth. The Sikh scripture, according to this school, was thus a collaborative effort, and there was no authentic version of the pre-canonical text. Other scholars, such as Pashwara Singh and Jivan Dual, agree with it and build upon this view. The dubious nature of Sikh scriptures should not come as a surprise to many Sikhs. Regardless, a minority of scholars states that there was no change at all, and the hymns were and the hymns, and all the hymns of the gurus were preserved. For the sake of argument, we will accept this position. 
Over 13 different Hindu saints and mystics hymns are part of the modern scriptures. Even the teachings of Muslim figures such as Farid al-Din Masoud are found in them. On the surface, this may seem like a positive image of, once again, pluralism. But just as Buddhism and Hinduism's messages are soiled by this attempt to be inclusive, the same goes for Sikhism. Because taking both Muslims and Hindus as holy men, when their views explicitly contradict, is a major problem. The Hindu influence becomes obvious when two of the central tenets of Hindu belief, namely panentheism and reincarnation, are also parts of Sikhism. The first page of Guru Granth Sahib states, There is only one God, and it is called the truth. It exists in all creation, and it has no fear. It does not hate, and it is timeless, universal, and self-existent. You will come to know it through the grace of the Guru. Furthermore, it also states, The ultimate eternal Lord is the soul, and the soul is the ultimate eternal Lord. So God, according to Six, is both in all his creation and is every human soul. If you watched my previous section on Hinduism, you will know where this is going. Six scholars use two terms to, prefer, to refer to this panentheistic nature. Nirgun, meaning without attributes, and Sargun, meaning with attributes. These definitions go perfectly to explain why panentheism is illogical. The Sikh believes that God, without attributes, manifests himself in his creation and gains attributes. So does God have attributes or does he not have attributes? The answer, according to Sikhs, is both at the same time, because he exists in everything and has no attributes. This is contradictory. I hope you all learned something from this video. Inshallah, we will be continuing to part three of this series soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.